So this is going to be a real quick history in robotics for all of you guys. Robotics is actually, uh, the term robot was first coined in uh, an early 1900s play called uh, Rosam's Universal Robots, which was a Czech uh, play about a guy builds robots, the robots uprise, kill the guy, take over the world, which really set the precedent for uh, robotics movies for the rest of the world life. But uh, that was where the robot came from. It's a Czech word meaning slave. And that's really what we think of robots. We hope them help they suddenly become our slaves that do all of our bidding and everything else. And that is true. They are doing that already. But that's where that word came from. So you now we know where robot came from. ka -ching. No. But the very first robots were really built and have been thought about for a very long time. Leonardo da Vinci attempted to build one of the first robots. He had the designs for an automated suit of armor that he hoped could walk along. And he didn't get very far into that, but he did work on it. And he made other automatons too, basically mannequins that have complex gearing that make them appear to move and appear human almost. And those ideas of automatons uh, continued on through from his time onward. And one of the most advanced was a few built in Europe where they could actually write out calligraphy. A whole letter could be written by one of these machines. The trouble with these machines is that they didn't really have any understanding of what they were doing. They were a clock, essentially. And just the same way a clock hand goes around the circle and then starts over again, these robots would write the letter and then start over again. They had no conception of what they were doing. And these are the three things that robots have to have. Robots have to be able to sense the environment, they have to make a decision about what they sensed, and then they have to take some action on that. So basically they have to have an eyes, brain, and some kind of a body to move around in the real physical world. The first robot, the first really true robot that people consider to be a true machine was Unimate, which was built uh, basically in 1961, although the design started a little bit earlier in like 1955-56. But Unimate was an industrial robot arm, and the reason it was considered the first true robot was because it was reprogrammable. It went from being a solid piece of clockwork that could, couldn't really be changed without being completely redesigned to a machine that was adaptable, and you simply changed its thoughts, basically, its programming, to make it do a new task of grabbing this thing and moving it over there. And GM used these. The problem with Unimate, though, was it didn't really have any kind of sensing, it didn't really have any kind of decision-making capability outside of its programming. And if you are familiar with programming, it is basically clockwork. You go here, you go here, you go here, then you come over here, then you come back over here, and so on and so forth, and you circle back around. That's how a program works. That's changing a little bit currently, but we'll talk about that in a moment. But anyway, Unimate wasn't really a true robot in the sense of the world word because it wasn't a decision-making, sensing machine. It was a machine with a variable intelligence, basically, which made it put it into the realm of robotics, but it was just a re reprogrammable machine. These 3D printers are basically the equivalent of a Unimate. <coughs> anyway. By the 1980s, consumer robots started coming out, and one of the most notable of that was uh, Topo, which was a little robot that had angled wheels coming out the side like this that it rolled around on. And it was created by the guy who founded Atari, you know, the game who made Pong and everything else. The trouble with all of these robots was that their consumer, their user interface was horrible. What they did was the robot could kind of understand words, could kind of detect the environment, could kind of do some stuff. But the trouble was, if a person wanted to do anything with it, you had to program what that word caused it to do, how it was going to do it, and so on and so forth. And if you put them into your house, you had to say, go to the refrigerator by going two feet forward, turn left, go three feet forward, turn right, da 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 so on and so forth. You had to either program it through code, or in a very minute and in-depth way, make this robot do something. So they weren't ever consumer robot like Rosie the Robot, which had actually been introduced 20 years earlier in the Jetsons. But anyway, who cares? So, Topo, there was that. Nothing happened in robotics from that point onward. The internet kind of showed up and took away all the people who would have thought about robots and had them build things like, I don't know, Google and Facebook. But in 1998 and 99, a robot was released that became very significant, which was the Roomba. And the Roomba is a robot vacuum cleaner. That's all it is. The truck, and it was based on work by Rodney Brooks, who, which was based on behavior-based robotics, which is creating very simple things, programs and sub-functions that the robot uses 
that come together to create something that appears more complex. Now, the vacuum cleaner was very successful because they figured out how to use simple computing and a low-cost platform to create something that did something practical inside of a home. So the Roomba is pretty successful. It doesn't do a very good job vacuuming, but it was the first consumer robot that actually worked and people could use, which was a big deal. And again, there was about another 10-year spread between robotics. In 2005, though, there was a big jump that happened when the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, started uh, the Grand Challenge, which was one of the very first challenges that DARPA did, the first one with real notoriety. But DARPA started this, and the, first, and the idea was to have a car drive 200 some odd miles without anybody helping it, out on rural roads. First year, everybody failed. The farthest car was Sandstorm, built by Carnegie Mellon, which only went eight miles. Who cares? The next year, uh, seven or eight or ten cars finished, a bunch of cars finished. Stanley from Stanford, which was built by Sebastian Thrun, Thrun who eventually went on to run Google X, uh, that car won. And Google basically bought that project uh, with Thrun and his whole team, brought it into them and started the driving car projects. And that's really where autonomous cars really started getting going because computing had reached a point where it could fit inside a car and still do enough because that was really what was slowing robots down before. The robots in the 80s simply didn't have the processing power to do anything terribly significant. But now, today, we are at a point where computing has caught up far enough that robots actually can do very intelligent things. And many of the technologies that you would ever imagine a robot to do do exist and have been proven. They just haven't come all together into a single machine. There's a robot over here that makes pancakes. There's a robot over here that drives your car. There's a robot, yada, yada, yada. But none of them have come together into a single robot butler. <laughs>